Hello, I'm Scott Leslie, and I'm here with Isaiah Lankham and Matthew Slaughter. We'll be watching a pre-recorded session entitled A Framework for Simple and Efficient Bootstrap Validation in SAS with Examples. So once the recording completes, Isaiah and Matthew will be answering questions that you submit via the chat window. So let's get started. Hello, I'm Isaiah Lankham. And I'm Matthew Slaughter. And we're beyond excited to bring you our SAS Global Forum 2021 virtual session, a framework for simple and efficient bootstrap validation in SAS with examples. After spending just a couple of minutes on context, most of this video will be an extended demo of bootstrap validation. And you're more than invited to follow along using the code, which is at our GitHub page, github.com slash saspy dash bffs. As we'll see, bootstrap validation allows us to use our full training set for both model building and model validation, resulting in no loss of statistical power when compared to commonly used techniques like cross validation. So just to remind you about why we validate predictive models, imagine the all too familiar scenario. You have observations for two variables, x and y, and we'd like to use values of x to predict values of y. We start typically in this scenario with a scatter plot, where we're going to plot each of our ordered pairs, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on, all the way through x and y n. And if you didn't know any better in this scenario, you might be inclined to say, hey, I'm going to fit a really squiggly blue line that goes through every point in my training data set exactly. I mean, come on, what model could be a better fit for the data in my training set? The problem is that the blue squiggle doesn't actually do a very good job when you look outside of the training data set. So let's imagine that even though our blue squiggle has a really, really huge R squared, that if we have some additional data, some external validation data, say these orange squares here, that the blue line is not going to do a very good job going through them compared to the boring old brown least squares regression line. And so this parsimonious model, this model that uses the least complexity possible, which only has an R squared of like 70%, is actually going to do a much better job than our overfit model with our overly optimistic performance metrics. We'll talk a little bit more in detail later about what we mean by optimism, but for now, just think of an optimistic model as one that lies about the quality of its performance, especially when you compare it to some type of external validation data set. So now that we've talked about why we validate predictive models, let's talk a little bit about how so that we can understand where bootstrap validation fits into this model, model validation that we always should be doing. So the example that we just saw illustrates the concept of what's called external validation, where we have our original data set that we're going to use to train a model. And then somehow we're lucky enough to have, in addition to that, a validation data set. So you could imagine maybe the original data set comes from the year 2020, the year we'd all like to forget, and the validation data set comes from 2021. So we don't have it yet when we're building the model, but we want to use it after we built the model in order to understand just how good our model actually is. You should always do external validation whenever you can. However, when we have just our original data set, when we don't have the validation data set, either because it can't exist or because it's just not at a point where we have that data set yet, we should always be thinking to also do what's called internal validation. And an internal validation is where we try to get as much as we can out of our original data set by itself. When we're working with a training data set just by itself, typically what people like to do is they like to say, well, I'm going to take my training data set and I'm gonna partition it. I'm gonna use part of my data for model development. And then the part that I reserve, I'm going to use for validation which works okay. There's no reason that this is not a way to go. And there are some really powerful, really common techniques that people use like split sample and cross validation. But what we're here to do today is to tell you that there's a different way that you can go about doing this. And that different way 
is where you're allowed to use your full data for model development. And we can then use something like bootstrapping, which allows us to resample our data set to build model validation data sets. So that when we use something like bootstrap validation, the fact that we're using our full data for model development means that there's no loss of statistical power. How cool is that? So now that we've reminded you about the need for validating predictive models, and we've talked about how there's this difference between external and internal validation, we're going to do an extended demo of bootstrap validation, which is a very specific form of internal validation. And we're going to show you how it works on real data. So Matthew, how about you tell us just how real the data is that we're going to use? Yes, we're using a publicly available data set from the CDC, and we're using a data step to define an indicator variable for hypertension. And we're keeping nine covariates from this data set that track various vital statistics or demographic characteristics, some of which are plausibly related to hypertension and others which are probably not. Yeah, so I think it's important to note here that uh, the paper that this talk is based on has complete details for where this data set comes from and uh, the steps that uh, we went through in order to prepare it for this example. So uh, at the end of the uh, video, we will uh, remind you where you can get that paper. But uh, in thinking about the original data set, I remember that there were quite a few more columns that we could have used as potential predictors. So why did we limit ourselves to just nine here? Right. Why, we're going to use a logistic regression to model this hypertension outcome. And we know that we don't have that large a data set since we're only keeping 178 observations that have no missing values. And for that reason, we don't want to overload our model with a huge number of spurious predictors. The model that would be produced that from that would definitely not be any good. And even if we're going to validate the model afterwards, we still want to follow modeling best practices from the start in order to get a valid model. Yeah, and so bootstrap validation, unfortunately, is not some type of magic wand. But when we use it, when we're modeling in good faith, we will get a lot of really great results in understanding the quality of the model we build. And uh, spoiler alert, um, not all of these nine predictors will actually be helpful for us. All right, now that we've got a data set, we need to train a model so that we can validate it. We're using logistic regression and proc logistic to try to predict the hypertension indicator we created above. And we're using ODS select and ODS output statements to control which output objects are displayed, and also to capture the C statistic, which is our performance statistic we're interested in, in a data set. Yeah, so in the example that we saw before, the really abstract example at the beginning, we were looking at just normal linear regression and R squared as a measure of model performance. Here we're using logistic regression to build a classifier, a binary classifier, and we're using the C statistic as our way of determining model performance. Is there maybe a different name people might have heard for the C statistic? Well, C stands for concordance, but the C statistic is also equivalent to the area under the ROC curve for logistic regression. So people may be familiar with it by that name. Yeah, and I usually tend to think of the concordance as the percentage of cases in the training data set that the binary classifier gets right. So here we're saying that the model we build is right 70% of the time in classifying the things in our sample. So how would we actually go about knowing what to put in ODS select and ODS output? Good question. In this case, I already know the names of the output objects that are created, but when you're just starting out with that new procedure, you probably don't know that. So you should check out the ODS trace statement, which causes SAS to print the names of any output objects that are created to the log. So you would first run your procedure with ODS trace on, find the names of the output objects, and then use those in ODS output to capture the specific statistics you want. And you can check out our paper for more information on how that works.
Now, in order to use bootstrap validation on the model we built in the last step, we first need to pull a series of samples from our original data so that we can iterate over them in later steps. We're using unrestricted random sampling with replacement to create 500 samples from our original data set identified in the data set by this variable named replicate. One, two, three, through 500, and so on. Yeah, so just to be clear, these are not replicants. So if you're a Blade Runner fan, you will get why that's funny. But um, let's talk about uh, why we're creating 500 bootstrap samples here. So simulation studies have shown that 100 to 200 bootstrap samples are often enough to get stable estimates of your model's performance. But they've also shown that for small data sets, it helps to have up to 500 for increased stability. And we only have 178 observations, so that's not that large. In general, there is a trade-off between having more samples for better stability and having fewer samples for better performance, because we are going to have to iterate over each of these samples. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that rather than creating 500 data sets individually on disk, we are using this really cool trick with PROC Survey Select to have all of our 500 bootstrap samples, these samples we created with replacement, sit on top of each other within a single data set, which will make the processing much easier later. Definitely simplifies the data management. All right, the next step in the process is going to be to train a model in each of our 500 bootstrap samples, as well as testing each of those individual models on the original data set. So we have two proc logistic steps that train each of those models and test them using a by statement and the replicate variable created above in order to iterate over the sample. We're also using ODS output again to capture the performance statistics, both when they're trained on each bootstrap sample and when tested on the original data. And we're using various ODS statements to hide output in for better performance. We don't really want to display the full model output for 500 logistic regressions. Yeah, so to summarize, we have taken our original data set, the 178 rows, we've treated it like it's a population. So this is the way we do bootstrapping. Treat it like it's a population. We do sampling with replacement to build each of our 500 samples from it, each of our bootstrap samples. And then in each of those 500 samples, we've built a logistic regression model. And then we've seen how each of those 500 models performs according to the original data set. Right, and you can see that the performance often declines from the bootstrap model trained on its own sample and when it's tested on the original data, which does indicate some level of overfitting. Yeah, and so that's going to give us then estimates for this idea of optimism, which will tell us how overfit maybe our original model was. Exactly. So let's talk a bit, though, about the process here. So we're using by statements in order to iterate over the bootstrap data set that we made with the stacking of bootstrap sample one, bootstrap sample two, and so on into a single data set. So usually when I'm thinking about repeating something in SAS, I want to use a macro. So why not use a macro here rather than a by statement? Good question. We have actually tried the macro version, and I'll go ahead and run that now. It works by using a single proc logistic step, just repeated 500 times by a macro. And this version is unfortunately a lot less efficient. You can see that it ran in over 12 seconds, whereas the original version using by statements took a little over one and a half seconds. And I think it's actually quite intuitive to understand why this is less efficient. It, with this macro, SAS has to compile and run proc logistic 500 times, whereas the original version with the by statement just runs proc logistic twice and iterates across the whole data set each time. If we had a larger data set, you can imagine that it would be even less efficient in order to read through the data set 500 times. 
All right, now that we've measured the naive performance of each bootstrap model on the original bootstrap sample, and then tested each bootstrap model on the original data, we have a series of performance statistics for each model. And if we take the difference of those and then average across all samples, we have a bootstrap estimate of the optimism of our model, which indicates the level to which our model is overfit and the extent to which performance would degrade when applied to new data. It's expressed on the scale of our original performance statistic which was the C statistic, which ranges from 0 to 1. So 0 0.07 is not huge, but it is notable and indicates that our model was overfit to some extent. Yeah, and so to summarize, using the steps that are in the paper that this talk is based on, here we're on step 5, we have taken our original data set, we've done resampling with replacement, as we typically do with bootstrapping, built our 500 bootstrap samples, in each of those samples, we built a proc logistic model mimicking the original model that we built. We then did the scoring of our original data set on each of those 500 bootstrap models. And that gave us 500 estimates for the optimism, essentially the amount of overfitting, a way of measuring, or at least trying to get a sense of the amount of overfitting of our original logistic regression model. And so here we're combining all of those estimates of optimism from each of the 500 bootstrap samples to get a single final estimate of optimism. And let's talk a little bit about why we're using proc SQL here to do that winnowing down process to a single final estimate of optimism. Is there some other way we could do that in SAS instead? Sure, there's always more than one way to do something in SAS. And if you prefer, you could easily use a combination of data steps and proc means to perform this calculation. I think it's convenient that proc SQL allows you to do some arithmetic and aggregate all in one step. And that's why we're doing it here this way, just for concision. It's also possibly a little more efficient. So you pulled out your Swiss army knife and used all of its functions at once. Exactly. Now we have a data set which contains our bootstrap estimate of the optimism of the model. And we also captured in step one a data set with the naive performance of our model on its original data. By combining those two data sets and taking the difference of the original performance and the optimism, we can calculate a validated measure of our model's performance or an optimism corrected C statistic. You can see that the performance of our model declined somewhat from around 0.7 to 0.62, which is the difference between a pretty good model and a model that's just okay. So that does indicate that our model was probably overfit to some extent. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So not only do we know that our model was probably overfit, we have a sense of how much roughly we overfit by. But rather than having to like start over and try to use a different set of predictors and go through this whole process again, is there maybe some way we could incorporate automatic variable selection while we're doing bootstrap validation so that we don't just have all these spurious predictors in the first place? Yeah, if we had used an automatic variable selection process in our original proc logistic step that created our first model, we would only need to then repeat that variable selection process in each of the 500 models we built on each bootstrap sample. So there would be some increased overhead in repeating that variable selection process, but programmatically it's quite easy to incorporate that into the bootstrap validation. So what I'm hearing is write your original modeling step, proc logistic or whatever, and then copy and paste, and then just tweak a little bit to use the bootstrap samples instead of the original data set. Right, and I think we should have an example of that in our paper. Absolutely. And on that note, let's go ahead and call this good for the demo. And let's go to our call to action where we remind people where to get that paper. The takeaway we want you to get from this presentation is to please use internal validation for your predictive models and consider bootstrap validation when you want to validate without losing any statistical power by partitioning your data. The trade-off, of course, being computing resources. It takes time to form bootstrap samples and to repeat the modeling step a whole bunch of times.
If you're interested in more details, please look up our paper in the SAS Global Forum 2021 Proceedings, paper number 1034. And also, please replicate everything you've seen here. Go to our GitHub and download the examples and spend some time with them and contact us if you want to know more. Always happy to talk about validation with anyone and everyone. So thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Global Forum. Welcome back. Um, we've monitored the chat session during this presentation. Now we have approximately 10 minutes. We might be able to go a little bit past 10 minutes to answer, ask Isaiah and Matthew uh, questions about this uh, presentation. So the first one I see in the chat was from Joni. Uh, she had a question about the best model for each bootstrap sample using some kind of uh, variable selection uh, method. Right, I can answer that. In the running example in the presentation, we did not use any variable selection, but we do have an example from our paper that shows how you can incorporate that into the validation. And it's as simple as adding uh, selection options to your proc logistic, both the original one that builds your first model and the one that iterates over all the bootstrap samples and builds models on each of those. So go check out our GitHub or our paper on SAS communities to see that example. Great, thanks, Matthew. Uh, the next question was uh, asking about the specific reason to use an inner join uh, rather than a left so, um, or simply the, the common values. We're joining on the replicate variable, which is the variable automatically created by proc survey select to identify each bootstrap. So we expect the same values, one to 500, since we took 500 samples to occur in each of those data sets. And it shouldn't matter if it's an inner or left join since they should all be there. If for some reason, one of those bootstrap replicates got dropped, that would be a problem with our process. And we would definitely want to be aware of that. So I think it's desirable to have an inner join so anything would fall out if there was a problem. Okay, thanks, Matthew. I saw in the chat a question about where we can access this paper. So um, someone replied in the chat. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that. Um, these are obviously to be available on YouTube and then a GitHub. Um, Isaiah and Matthew, could you one of you uh, speak about where they can find the paper in in the Jupyter Notebook? Yeah, so all of our materials are on our GitHub. Uh, the link was put in chat. It's the uh, github.com slash saspy bffs. And if you go to that, that's our uh, GitHub organization where we have materials from lots of talks. And if you're curious about the name, the saspy bffs is because we also do a lot of materials on using SAS and Python together as if they were best friends forever because we really value uh, being able to use languages interoperably and everyone being a polyglot programmer. <laughs> Thanks, Isaiah. Uh, a few more questions here. Uh, how do we interpret the results from Bootstrap validate on model? Can the model accept or reject? Maybe uh, we can, um, maybe a little bit more clarification on that question unless uh, Isaiah or Matthew, if you can answer that. Well, I, I think I understand the question, which is that basically, I think what they want to know is, is can you accept or reject your model based on the results of this validation? And I think the answer is that it's up to you to establish what level of performance you think is acceptable for your model and what level of optimism you think is acceptable. In the, the case of our example where you, we're using the C statistic, we probably would be hoping for something with a C statistic of higher than 0.7 or so. We might consider a model with a 0.6 C statistic acceptable, but not great. Anything below that would probably be borderline or not acceptable. But that would be a choice you have to make based on your problem, your business requirements. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Um, 
actually answered Keith's question as well. So thanks for doing two for one on that answer there. Um, Chuck had a question about what if you're using uh, lasso, an elastic net or a similar technique to select the variables? So in principle, that should work fine as long as you apply that technique to your original model and then to each model built in each bootstrap in the same way. The only caveat is that you need a procedure that supports those methods. So proc logistic, for example, does not, I think, natively support lasso. I think you would have to switch to another procedure. I believe HP logistic supports lasso and uh, probably HP gen select would also be an option. Great. Um, another question from Joni, when doing variable selection, what would be your index per of performance? Would you count the number of times variable subset would appear? So I would probably still pay attention to the optimism of the model. I'm not too concerned usually about the stability of the variable selection, but I'm trying to see how robust my modeling approach is to random variation in the data. So as long as the var variable selection is selecting good models in each bootstrap, I think that that's fine. Okay, thanks. I'm monitoring the chat here. I think I've covered anything. Uh, Please post again if I haven't. Um, can I had a question about the, the particular scenarios where bootstrap validation isn't uh, appropriate. Yeah, so bootstrap validation requires you to repeat your entire modeling process hundreds of times. And therefore, it's going to be increasingly computationally intensive, the more complex your model is, the larger your data set is. At the same time, other validation methods such as split sample development and cross validation will return more stable results the larger your sample size is. So the advantage of bootstrap validation relative to any other method goes down the larger your data set is. And it also can become impractical as your model becomes very complex. It's also worth noting that using the bootstrap won't necessarily save you if you are violating the assumptions of your model. If you create a regression model and just throw in dozens and dozens of garbage predictors, even though you have very few observations, the results of that model are going to be biased regardless of any validation you do. So it's always on the analyst to model in good faith before attempting any validation. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, monitoring the chat again, we've got some great uh, compliments on your presentation and paper. Um, Thank you much. You know, I've seen, some, I've been to SAS Global Forums for several years and, and viewed several presentations. And I, I love how you guys use the split screen there and back and forth that really um, made for a good presentation. And just to remind everyone that these presentations or all the content that this year will be on YouTube, uh, the SAS uh, channel on YouTube. So you can rewatch uh, the presentations or any of the presentations uh, basically forever. So um, I think we've covered everything here. Um, oh, one last, yeah, I think we've got everything. Um, just want to wrap it up here and thank Isaiah and Matthew for joining us today to answer questions about their presentation. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And thanks also to all the SAS Global Forum organizers for all their incredible behind the scenes work. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and for everyone who joined the live session and everyone who might watch this later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, we hope uh, you will continue to uh, explore all the other great content that we have available at SAS Global Forum uh, YouTube channel. And don't forget to take this session survey.
on the SAS Global Forum Attendee Hub. That wraps up this session. Good morning.